Good evening everyone, time for another Bitcoin report. I'm going to apologize ahead of time for extremely fast talking. This is my third take and it's very difficult to get these videos under 15 minutes, which is a YouTube restriction for new channels. So I'm used to my silver channel, which allows me to make my reports as long as I want. So until this channel is uh, approved by YouTube to do longer than 15 minute videos, I'm going to have to talk extremely fast because I have a lot to cover. So you're looking at the daily chart for the Bitcoin and I wanted to pull back actually just a little bit to the intraday and the four hour. And if you can see here on the volume, I don't have a trend line that I can use. so. But if I could draw the lines, I'll figure it out in this program. You can see the decreasing volume here going down. Now, it's very interesting because the Bitcoin is stabilizing around $20, even though it had a tremendous sell-off and crash down from 32 to 10 But there's a couple of really bullish signs here. One is that the volume that came in on the breakout buy that we had here, was superseded by the sell-off volume. Probably a lot of early adopters who dumped their bitcoins as we began to come back down at this point. You can see really high volume spike. Another spike here and then some more spikes as we came down around 10. But the interesting thing is we saw a tremendous increase in volume of buyers coming in once we hit 10 and it ran the price all the way to 25 and now it's beginning to stabilize around 20. So a tremendously bullish sign. Let's pull back out to the daily so I can show you. A lot of the detractors have said that uh, this is a Ponzi scheme, pump and dump, a crash, etc. because it crashed 60 something percent. But I want to take you out to the historicals and one of the key ones is the one that happened at 50 cents. Now back at 50 cents we were around 10 and it was near 20 but the bottom was 10 we rallied all the way to 50 plus and crashed all the way back down to 15 cents so you can see this is a larger crash percentage wise than the one we're experiencing right now and what did the Bitcoin do well you can see classical technical analysis once we got to this point of the old high we had a breakout on new volume that exceeded you can see this volume here exceeded anything we traded previously and we broke out and we ran and ran and ran without a test now this is the lowest test we had and well actually here we go we got a test back to 55 cents but then we got a new breakout again much higher volume than ever been seen before so this is a classic bull market and it trades just like all bull markets you can see new breakout new volume and uh, here we're penetrating into six and seven you'll see our breakout in the teens wasn't on a historical volume but again lots of volume and we broke out to the teens and here we are all the way up to 30 and to today so a classic bull market nothing to be surprised about something that uh, I don't really understand what the detractors are talking about there it doesn't make any sense this market is if, if you traded the dot-coms back in the 90s you saw this type of chart pattern with uh, all the legit companies Microsoft AOL Apple and others that ended up you know going up hundredfold hundreds fold and uh, and as well as the other worthless companies Webvan and uh, Toys.com, all kinds of other stuff. But anyway, so it remains to be seen whether Bitcoin is a dot-com type uh, flash in the pan or whether it's going to be a Microsoft, Apple type world-changing thing. I tend to subscribe to the latter. I think that Bitcoin is going to be something that's revolutionary. So. We'll have to wait and see, but uh, it is stabilizing at 20, and that's a good sign. So I want to jump over to a issue that has come up on the Bitcoin channel or the Bitcoin forum, 
and uh, this is a user who says he just got hacked and uh, if you go further down the thread uh, you, you'll see that he was an early adopter and he lost all of his bitcoins it was about 25,000 bitcoins that he lost and that's at today's market value about half a million dollars so he had an encrypted wallet and uh, it doesn't really matter because he was hacked to where a Trojan or basically I'll explain briefly what a Trojan is it's it's uh, something that is allowed in it, it goes back to Trojan horse explanation it's a uh, Trojan horse was a gift to the Greeks and it, it uh, was accepted as trusted and then it turned out there were soldiers and they came and took over the city so same thing with a Trojan on a computer it's something that's trusted it's something that you allow in and then it allows a backdoor for someone to come in and take over your computer so once that's taken over whether or not your wallet file is encrypted it doesn't really matter because this person who is running this thing is the equivalent of you sitting at the computer yourself so whatever you can do when you're sitting at your computer he can do while he's remotely controlling your computer so that's a big issue for Bitcoin and uh, this in my mind is the biggest issue around how do you protect your Bitcoin so I wanted to address three topics real quick here first of all I wanted to talk about the security of your operating system now this user was running Windows and Windows is a notoriously unsecure operating system one of the reasons why is because there are so many things that are allowed to address the processor at the same time and make changes to the operating system that's a weakness in Windows but you really can't blame Microsoft because if you run Windows the way Microsoft recommends you run it what you'll do is you'll go into your control panel and into users and when you set your user accounts you're going to make sure that you have no rights to change anything if you do that if you set up your computer exactly the way you want it to be and then flip out and log back in to a controlled user who has no rights to change anything then if you don't have the right to install any software then a Trojan isn't going to have the right to change anything on your computer so that's the first thing uh, you want to run a safe operating system that is hard to make changes to and that's going to be Linux or Mac OS but if you do run Windows you want to definitely run your Windows in a completely restricted environment so that even you can't make any changes you set it up the way you want it and then you can't change it the second point I wanted to make is that if you're going to try to protect your bitcoins then I would recommend that you probably want to have another computer that maintains the bulk of your bitcoins and it's not a computer that is accessible by the internet so the idea that I came up with I have a large number of wireless networks running and my suggestion is that if you want to have some Bitcoin machines that have the bulk of those assets you could put those machines on a private wireless network that doesn't have internet access so let's say you just went and bought a Netgear or Linksys router out of the box plugged it in but didn't plug it into your ISP it's going to broadcast the SSID that you can log into and it, uh, computers connected to it are going to get a wireless address now if you have your main box and you flip over to that address you can RDP to that box and get to it securely on a private network now if it's running Bitcoin it's not going to work if it's not on the internet so you you're gonna to have to flip it on the internet by changing networks but in theory you could flip it to another network that's on the internet send yourself the bitcoins to that or from that computer and then flip it back off of the internet and keep that as a secure box that keeps a deposit of your bitcoins and the other box that's constantly on the internet whether it's mining 
or doing transactions or whatever else, you'd have a minor amount of bitcoins on that box. That's something similar to what many people do and I do with bank accounts where you have multiple accounts in the same, uh, you can access the accounts by the same user, but they're separated accounts. So for example, I have a checking account that I have uh, funds in. I also have a savings account and I can transfer funds back and forth. Now, what hits one account can't hit the other account. So if you want to isolate an account, you can basically uh, put it in a type of DMZ or firewall and protect it and then transfer funds from it and, and to it, but it's not accessible. So same sort of idea. Uh, it's uh, not a perfect solution, but it is a best solution as we are looking at somebody who lost potentially a half a million dollars in bitcoins. So the last suggestion I wanted to make is that uh, the way you want to look at the way banks work right now. Now, of course, if someone accessed your computer and they completely took it over through a Trojan, then obviously they could have access to all of your accounts. If they put a keylogger on there, then they're going to see whatever passwords you type. So if you're going to your Chase bank account, then they're going to see your Chase password. They get in there and they break into your Chase and uh, they get your uh, password to get in your account and they could wire money anywhere they want and drain the balance of your account and uh, it's the same issue. The only difference is, is that if it's a bank account, normally there's a larger, a longer clearing time for those transactions. If you get in and dispute it, then there's a good chance they can pull back that money, cancel the transaction. But again, if somebody uh, put a Trojan on your computer, broke into your computer, got your passwords, got into Chase, wired money to Nigeria, went to, and called the person, had the person in Nigeria, passed the amount of time that's required, pull the funds out in cash and then disappear, then it's the same issue. So really the issues that are faced by bank banks and Bitcoin are, are similar. So my last suggestion I wanted to make is that for those of us that work for a Fortune 500 company, if you do, you're familiar with RSA encryption tokens that you have to use to access the network. The way that works is you have a fob on your keychain or you carry with you and it generates a number um, uh, roughly every 30 seconds or so. This is a number that's matched with a server that's back at the main site and if you don't type in that RSA encrypted number you can't access the network. So what that does is that demonstrates that the person who has access to the network is the person who also controls the fob that they're using to get there. So the only person who can get on that network is the person who physically possesses that fob. So my suggestion is that for Bitcoin that we probably need some type of RSA encryption generation that is running on another computer that can be coordinated with your Bitcoin application so that when you log in and try to send money or receive money on your Bitcoin application, you have to type in this encrypted fob which is running on another box that uh, you only can see. You have to physically be in the place to see that box generating that key and then that key authenticates you to buy or sell bitcoins. So it's a very disturbing situation and uh, I am welcome to any comments that anyone has as to the solution for this. This is in my opinion the Achilles heel of Bitcoin as well as some other issues and we'll talk about those next time and I'll talk to you next time.